You unlock this benefit with the key of Patreon. Beyond is another dimension. A dimension of thought. A dimension of speculation. A dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both waffle and substance. Of things and ideas. You've just crossed into the podcast zone. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Trekking Through the Twilight Zone. Uh, this is Julian and I working our way through all the Twilight Zone episodes one by one, giving our thoughts and opinions on each and every one. And we have reached Mr. Beavis and what a character Mr. Beavis is. Julian, what are your thoughts on this episode? Um, you know, this is one of those rare Twilight Zones where I really want to inhabit the world that it depicts. But in this case, only so that I can personally run down Mr. Beavis. Uh, I, I kind of hate him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I felt similar. <laughs> mm. Yeah, it's an interesting episode. In this episode, Mr. Beavis is the local kook. He's a bit of an eccentric. Um, and on, on one possibly the worst day of his life, he loses his job. He crashes his car and is evicted from his apartment. Uh, but when things are all about to turn dire, his guardian angel comes to him and gives him an opportunity to show him what is needed to be done to make his life better. And he does not like it. Um, I get the, this. This again, we, we mentioned in the last episode, this obviously the wonderful life thing and what your life could be. This this one has a slightly better theme. In the sense of it's sort of like, you know, be yourself. Like, you know, you you will you you can be a success if you want to be yourself, you know, accept who you are. Um, you know, however, there is a limit <laughs> where you'll yeah. be like, Yeah, I can be kooky and stuff, but I've got to be able to ingratiate myself into society. Um, and they play it quite hard on this, like mm. in every respect, that you know. He becomes irritant, an irritant throughout the episode. Um, somewhere between sort of like uh, Stan Laurel and um, uh, there was another comedian I was thinking about, sort of like just Pratt Falls and all that kind of thing. It, especially when he comes off the stairs at the big Jerry Lewis. That was it. Yeah. It felt sort of like somewhere between Stan Laurel and Jerry Lewis kind of sort of thing. And it, it began to grate on me very quickly. <laughs> well, and I... Look, I mean, I love the theme of the outsider and making room for eccentricity, and that's all great. Having said that, he looks like shit. You know, I mean, if 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 he showed up today, you think, okay, you're sort of like a hipster, but you're clearly going for like a Fox News sort of Tucker Carlson bow tie thing. Yeah. I mean, like, <laughs> I don't really know how to understand you, and he and. We're supposed to find it charming that he slides down a banister, which he slides down the wrong way, and you know clearly would have no testicles by the time he's yeah. done with that one slide. And all the kids love him; he's given food for free. You know, we're supposed to think that he's charming, except like his his desk looks like a nightmare. Mm. And you know, keep your desk however the hell you want at work. But you know, in every environment, there's always some jerk who's got like not just the family photos, but like the knickknacks on the desk. Mm -hmm. And you just think, like, yeah, maybe this uh, policy of tolerance has gone a little far because <laughs> it hurts my eyes to look at this person's desk. Yeah, I I have I, I haven't worked anywhere with allocated desking for over a decade. Um, we, I have hot desks, and I've worked in uh, you know open open desk environments. I uh, th that desk j j just sort of like it was one of those where I was just like no 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 that's there's so much wrong with that. Like I know people that have hot desks and have uh, will have a picture of their kids and family that they pull out every day and they put on their desk. All right, little things. Mm -hmm. top, you know, like a little calendar or something, and you can then pop away in your in your work bag and you take away with you at the end of the day. And I've got no problems with that. That's perfectly acceptable. That's not a problem. Fine. I've only ever known one person who's been allocated a desk, and it was for medical reasons because of their back and all this other stuff. And everyone has raised all desks. Fine, not a problem. And they did do this 
And it's sort of like they did go to the extent where they had a bunch of Smurfs and stuff all over their desk and these things. And you just sort of go, I get this idea of a a friendly environment and stuff, but like it just looks like crap. Mm -hmm. And it becomes a distraction. And it, 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 you know, it's then some poor cleaner's got to come around and clean that up. And it it starts to just get like, it bothers me. So this thing of when he's sort of packing away his desk and he's like, the other thing is, he has a model ship in work that he's working mm-hmm. on. And well, I know, right. He's working <laughs> on it at work. Yeah. Uh, give me, you know, also, right, that's weird. The other thing is, I, I mean, he's also got a super racist Glock, you know, that's like, <laughs> yeah. you know, a stereotype of African Americans um, with moving eyes and stuff. I mean, of course, <laughs> nobody objects to it for that reason, but today it'd be like, Oh man, you know, you cannot have that. Now this is supposed to take place in the twenties. Yes. Um, but I mean, yeah, so he's working on a model ship at work. I don't know when the hell he's working on this, just <laughs> sitting at his desk while everybody else is typing frantically. And the other thing is they mentioned that he loves bringing children into work. And if you can't have Christmas, you know, the, like, bringing the office to a standstill to have kids come in and sing, <laughs> then what's the point of having a job? What are you talking about? I mean, yeah. I you would hate this guy in real life. Yes. He's horrible. Yes. He he is. There was a, there was a show called The Fast Show uh, many years ago, a sketch show, and there's a character in that that was called, it was called uh, the cra- I'm the Crazy One. And basically, it was a guy in the office that wore the loud shirts and that sort of thing and would say to you, go, hey, 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 oh, go be careful around me. Hey, I'm the crazy one. Hey, yeah, everyone says I'm the crazy one. I'm the wacky one, which I hate. Mm-hmm. And it feels like that. And they've, they've, they've taken it to such an extent where you are like, this guy feels like it's false. It feels like that that enforced hipsteriness where it's like, I'm also I'm going to be eccentric in order to be obnoxious. Yeah. And that's and that's sort of the problem I have with him with him in this episode. I mean, also like he how is he he's playing zither music at work somehow? I mean, he drives this old jalopy that spews soot in the streets. Yeah. You know how like, you know, I mean, I'm irritated by motorcycles, you know, <laughs> revving themselves up in the street. Can you imagine me being around like, yeah. you know, you're poisoning all of us. You know, God forbid somebody walk through the streets with a single cigarette. Everybody near your car is just coughing. And yet, but we're supposed to think you're charming. You park in front of a fire hydrant. F you, jack off. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's this thing of like when he is presented with his alternate, which is, um, you know, he wears, a, he wears like a, a dark suit and... Um, he's given opportunities at work where he is, you know, a model employee and he's been, you know, he's been given an opportunity to be promoted. And, but then he doesn't, he's not friends with the kids and, you know, he's not this charming kook around town, but his landlady loves him. So he's got a place to live. Um, yeah, because he pays his rent. He's yeah. six weeks late in the main yeah. continuity. <laughs> Yeah, and this is the thing, like, there's nothing... When you look at the main version of him, there's... Usually this was set in the 20s. I don't think it is, because the car he has is a 1924, whatever it is. Right. I don't think it's meant to be set in 60, but I think it's meant to be set a bit, a bit maybe a little earlier. But there's, there's more modern cars, mm, right. um, um, you know, around him. And even then, I'm like, there must be a point where... There must have been a, pay, a point where the automotive... Yeah, we have the DVLA. I don't know what you guys have. The um, yeah, there must be some steps in and goes. Do you know what? It's not roadworthy anymore. Mm-hmm. <laughs> get, get it off the road. Well, nobody really did that. I mean, that yeah. was not back then. Um, you know, if you could drive it, you could drive it. And but people did complain about pollution. Mm. You know, once we once you get cities with streets for cars, it doesn't take very long before people complain about people being run down in the streets and you know air quality um, sure right yeah yeah no it it just feels like that and i think you are you're supposed to be you are supposed to be charmed by this guy and again i think if they were to turn it back and you got the right actor Mm. because the cast robin williams someone like robin williams yeah who could do this 
um, and do it with that level of energy and, and charm, you could get away with it. But this guy just, I don't know, there's just, he, he just, he, he's more Jim Carrey than Robin Williams. <laughs> <laughs> That's well put. Um, I, you know, the other thing is that the plot wants to underline this idea that he's loved by kids. And mm. that, you know, I mean, in the closing narration, it mentions, you know, like the, um, the magic of a child's smile, the magic of liking and being liked. Yeah. I mean, I don't really see that he's that liked. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, his colleagues seem to, you know, like there's the woman who wants to help him clear out his desk. But you and I would hate sharing an office with this prick. Yeah. Um, You know, yeah, the kids like him. But what does he do when he comes? I mean, they, you know, look, if I were a kid and I saw an adult slide down the banister, I think that that's fun. But then he goes out in the street, grabs the ball from a kid and throws it clearly past all of the kids. (laughs) You you know, like. He's just interrupting a game and stealing their ball and throwing it down the street. Like, you're a jerk. I yeah. don't see this love that I'm obviously supposed to believe. And again, I think this comes down to the staging. You know, they choose options. It, the, you know, it, it's it's meant to have a kinetic energy, isn't it? Like, he's getting involved into the stuff. It's the same as when he gets given the apple. He walks for a clear couple of seconds before he's given the apple. Like, he's got his hand out for ages. <laughs> And I'm pretty yeah. sure Tony, who gives it, is like, oh, all right, you can have it. Just go away. <laughs> um, I don't know. It, yeah, it's just not well set up to show that he is this... Um, likeable. Uh, likeable character. And again, one of the things is, again, is the ending of this episode. Being Returning back to this character, this, this likeable Mr. Beavis this quirky, supposedly likable Mr. Beavis, doesn't end up with a benefit. Mm-hmm. Like, it ends with him... Uh, homeless. homeless. Like, yes. How is it, like, if this was, again, like, you know, if you really wanted to hammer home this idea of sort of, like, you know, being yourself and, you know, being quirky, thing, like, have him drive back and find that they've clubbed together and paid off his rent or something exactly. to give him an opportunity. Like, you need exactly. to show that these people love him for who he is. But you don't. You just get this... This you, you, The only... In fact, he gets out of a ticket because of a guardian angel on several yeah. occasions. It's like, it's... it's the, you don't get to see the benefit of him being the Mr. Beavis that you started with. Uh, to well, anything, I think the guardian angel's right throughout this episode. <laughs> Well, I mean, the guardian angel is done really horribly. I I hate the guardian angel and the way he intervenes to bring the car back. I mean, so so when Beavis is given the opportunity to change his life and you see him in a suit and he's successful, I think, great. This is going, you know, like you have another chance and you can figure out how to, you know, maybe use a little bit of that money to help these latchkey kids. Mm. Like. You know, have a nice talk with them so you don't get to be the, like, quirky uncle character or the quirky neighbor, you know, uh, uh, from a sitcom. But instead, you get to be a sort of, like, you know, uh, slightly weird uncle who's got a job and can pay for, you know, some food now and then and have a serious conversation. You could still have a relationship with these kids. Instead... You know, it's like, well, I don't get to be the totally quirky guy. There's no middle road here. There's <laughs> just, you should be able to destroy your workplace, make ships at work, and yeah. bring kids into work, and play your Sither music, or else freedom dies. Um, well, yeah, that's one of the things. It's, again, one of those points in this episode is where they, they try to hammer things. And again, I, I know that each of the points has got to be hit home because they've only got so much time, and they've got to hit them hard. So you get to see that his desk is is a disaster. But then you're also told that his work is crap as well. Mm-hmm. So like when he loses his job, it's not it's nothing to do with his desk. I mean the, the boss is like, no, I'm glad I can get rid of you. Because your work is crap, I can get rid of you. But it means the benefit of getting rid of this other stuff that you do. So it's almost like but if he was like if it was the other way around, where he's like, look, your work's really good. But you're being disruptive, so I've got to let you go. You know, then yeah. In, in, in fact, the the boss says, "Oh, he's late again. Send him into my office when he gets here." 
So not yeah. only is his work shit, but he's he can't even get to work on time. No. Regularly. I mean, yeah, there's a, you know, there's a version of the, like, I feel like this wants to be Bartleby the Scribner. Mm. But Bartleby mm-hmm. is a good worker. He just prefers not to. I mean, he's a smart guy. He's just the oddball who, you know, and they, they go out of his way to make accommodations for. It. They're trying to save him. Here, we're supposed to have the Bartleby-like sympathy for him, except yes. he's a dick, you know, and yeah. everyone's gone out of their way. You know, Bartleby knows that we are supposed to feel kind of ambivalent about that character. Here, we're just supposed to like him, and it's shot through with race and class privilege and, you know, uh, go sleep. Go sleep. My final thought is go sleep in your car, Mr. Beavis. No one wants you here. <laughs> yes. No, no, I agree. This episode, the, the guardian angel in this episode is like an intervention. It's someone stepping in and going, Look, we love you very, very much. We really do. But we've got to talk about your behavior and everything. <laughs> And, you know, don't forget, we love you. I mean, we're here to support you, but you've got to change. And look, I'm going to show you what could happen if you change. I mean, one of the things is, like, in him changing, like, he doesn't become, um, like, what's it, uh, from American Psycho, you know, sort of like mm-hmm. Patrick Bateman. Like, he doesn't become, like, a complete sort of, like, Wall Street sociopath. That would be a that very be... Dip- special episode of The Twilight Zone. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Like to the full misogynist serial killer. <laughs> yeah, like you know, it doesn't get the all that far. Like, like you say, accepting that your life has got to change to some middle ground in order for you to accommodate society and work as an adult is actually not a bad message of going like, do you know what? Keep your do you know what you want to make boats and you want to be friends with the kids and all sort of stuff. Fine, do that at the out of hours. Do that that's for the weekends. You've got to calm down, you've got to do this stuff as a hobby. But Jesus, you've got to stop being this guy because it's not healthy. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it, it's just yeah, a really, and that, and that really... would be, you know, look, especially today. I mean, I find myself looking back and I mean, look, it, it, there are none of the women in that workplace who have not been harassed on the job. OK, yes. <laughs> they have to wear skirts that are, you know, some short skirts. Every single one of them has had to endure some sort of humiliating comments at the very Mm -hmm. minimum to get and keep that job but we're supposed to feel sorry for mr (laughs) beavis yeah (laughs) you know this dick who just won't accommodate anyone no selfish prick i hate him (laughs) yeah i i feel the same way we should leave it there that uh yeah um you know mr beavis yes uh (laughs) We have similar thoughts on that episode. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, there we go. Uh, our thoughts on, on Mr. Beavis. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and I hope you enjoyed our trek through the Twilight Zone, and we shall talk to you on the next episode. <laughs>